Should we get started? Let's get started. Rock and roll. Okay. So, yeah, of course, I just want to begin on the backdrop of what we discussed over the course of the last two weeks you know, with the realization that the biblical feasts might, to some, be the Jewish holidays, but I prefer for them as biblical holidays because while they certainly are Jewish holidays, they have a message to everyone who believes in the Bible. And everyone who is a Bible believer, and by definition, sees in every word of the Bible a message to each and every one of us, necessarily sees in these holy days something that will impact on our lives, whether part of Israel or not. That is, this is the word of God. And, and God is telling us about these holy days because the gifts for us. So that's true, of course, with respect to all of the holy days in the Bible. But as I'm sure everyone is aware, it's particularly true regarding Sukkot. Why? So, of course, inevitably, and this is this is already something that you can't help but consider resonating in light of what we're experiencing here right now. You know, we read in a few places in the Bible of the final battle that is fourth by the forces of godlessness against God, against God and against his people. And where's ground zero? Right here, Jerusalem. And in particular, of course, the two most prominent prophecies in this regard Ezekiel chapter 38, the war of Gog and Magog. I can't help mentioning here that, you know, when you have the description of the, bat the battle in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 5, there's a list of the nations that are accompanying Gog and Magog to do battle against this land. And the very first one on the list, first word of Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 5, is Persia. Just noticing. Okay, close parentheses on that. But, um, but in terms of the destination, the destination explicitly in verse 12 is that they are coming up against those who dwell and... I'm translating literally from the Hebrew, even though your translations will probably differ. Those who dwell upon the navel of the earth. So, of course, the navel of the earth, just as the navel is the source of sustenance of the developing fetus. So all blessings come into the world from Jerusalem. So we know that Ezekiel is talking about Jerusalem. But the other version, whether it's exactly the same battle or not, is a subject of debate. It certainly seems to be two different ways of describing the same battle. In Zechariah chapter 14. Yeah. And of course, in Zechariah chapter 14, there's no ambiguity whatsoever with respect to where the battle takes place. In verse 2, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half the city shall go forth into captivity, into exile. But the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So the battle that takes place in Jerusalem. And of course, what we read then, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle and there is 
a description of what then ensues, interestingly, like in Ezekiel chapter 38, there is a massive earthquake. In Zechariah chapter 14, the earthquake splits the Mount of Olives into two. It's pretty massive. And then we read that everyone is fleeing. The Lord, my God, my God shall come and all the holy ones with you. And in verse 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall the Lord be one and his name one. And what is most directly germane for the purposes of our discussion right now is in verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, um, of course, that there's a connection between all nations and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, in particular, is explicit in the Bible. There's no question. I, I just feel compelled to add here I don't know why this wasn't always obvious to me, but it dawned on me a year ago, I think it was actually during the Feast of Tabernacles, during Sukkot, that I realized that, you know, I kind of figured that when we read about everyone that is left of all the nations, then you're just talking about the survivors. But there is, why would you think that these are just random survivors? That when these nations come to do battle against God in Jerusalem, the nation, maybe the nation as a whole, or the rulers of the nation chose to come to do battle against God, but there were individuals who are on God's side all along. And when those nations are destroyed, those will be the survivors. Those will be those who remain of all of those nations. And what do they do? They come here. Ground Zero, to Jerusalem, to celebrate Sukkot. So you have explicitly in the Bible this extraordinary universalist dimension in Sukkot, in the Feast of Tabernacles, more than any other holiday. That is, again, granting that with all holidays, if you believe in the Bible, you believe that these holidays, if they're cited explicitly in the Bible, have a message to every one who is a Bible believer, but here it's explicit in the Bible, there's no question. Except that having noted that theme, that dimension that is, after all, explicit in the last chapter of Zechariah, there's an obvious glaring question. Because if we consider the passage in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, that details the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot, to the greatest degree, well, there really isn't any competition. It is really explicitly. Leviticus chapter 23. Now, we've described Leviticus chapter 23 previously as well. We noted it last week in speaking about Yom Kippur. We noted it two weeks ago in speaking about Rosh Hashanah. But the truth of the matter is that the description of those days doesn't hold, hold a candle to the description of Sukkot. So just to read together. Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse 33. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no manner of servile at work. Seven days you shall bring an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. The eighth day is a whole other story. We're not going to get into that right now. And in particular, further elaborating from verse 39, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord seven days 
on the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And there are two particular dimensions of observance that are singled out in particular. In verse 40, and you shall take you on the first day the fruit of goodly trees, the branches of palm trees and boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook, the four species that we wave on the holiday of Sukkot. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Tantalizingly, the Torah does not explicitly tell us what these four species, that of course we take to this day, are intended to represent. That's the subject of discussion, multiple answers to that. But in any case, we continue, verses 41 and on, you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year, is a, stu a statute forever in your generations, you shall keep it in the seventh month, and you shall dwell in booths. You can say booths, you can say tabernacles, uh, you could say Sukkot, because that's the word in Hebrew. So you shall dwell in Sukkot seven days. All that are homeborn in Israel shall dwell in booths, in Sukkot. And here, there is an explicit explanation of what the sukkah signifies, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in Sukkot, in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. Ah, so this is a remembrance of the Exodus. Whose Exodus? Israel's exodus. So what connection is there to all the nations of the world? It's not clear. And I'll, I'll just note further, the next verse, which is clearly the synopsis of this entire presentation of the holy days of God, in verse 44, and Moses declared unto the children of Israel the appointed seasons of the Lord. So again, the commandment is for Israel. But I'm going to stress further, while with respect to Rosh Hashanah, there wasn't any historical basis that was explicitly invoked in the Torah. It's a day of blasting of the horn, as we discussed. With respect to Yom Kippur, so we have this historical dimension of when Moses comes down with the second set of tablets, but still explicitly in Leviticus chapter 16, Leviticus chapter 23, there's nothing about any parochial historical dimension that underlies this observance. With respect to Sukkot, there is. So how does that compute with the extraordinary universal dimension that we see in Zechariah chapter 14? There's a tension here, isn't there? Is, is it about the history of Israel, or is it about a message, granted, it's not a message right now, but a message that ultimately will be universalized for the entire world, for all nations. Maybe, in order to get a handle on this question, first thing we should be exploring is some basic definitions. What are Sukkot, and what are the Sukkot that God made the children of Israel to dwell in when he brought them out of the land of Egypt? There are a number of passages that we could invoke in the Bible to try to define what a Sukkah is. But perhaps the best would be taking a look, this has nothing to do with the holiday of Sukkot, but nonetheless, taking a look at Isaiah chapter 4. In 
Isaiah chapter 4, there is a description after the day of judgment upon Israel, upon the nations, of what takes place, if you will, in the world that is fixed up after all of the corruption that exists in our world today. So we read, I'll begin reading in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 3. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written unto life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have rinsed the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of destruction. And the Lord will create over the whole habitation of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. Inevitably, there's an association that we can very readily sense here with the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. We'll get to that in a moment. For over all, or in addition to, every honor shall be a canopy. So is this the definition of sukkah? No, actually it's not. We're not get, we haven't gotten to that yet. Canopy, the Hebrew, I think a fairly well-known Hebrew word, chupa, which of course is the word that we use for the wedding canopy. The next verse, the next verse invokes the sukkah. And there shall be a sukkah. So you can read it as tabernacle booth. The word in Hebrew is sukkah. There shall be a sukkah for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a refuge and for a covert from downpour and from rain. That's the sukkah. Again, a shadow in the daytime from the heat and the refuge and a covert from downpour and from rain. So what is a sukkah then? On the most basic level, a sukkah is a refuge. Now, I guess I should qualify that by saying to some degree, because it's not a house. It's not the preferable form of refuge. When you're in a house, you have solid walls, you have a solid roof, and you're protected from the elements. But a sukkah is not that. A sukkah is walls. What it has overhead is thatching. Thatching that ensures that there is some degree of shadow from the heat that is to be very strict to your definitions for a sukkah to be valid you have to have majority shade as opposed to majority sun. Yeah, but you also get sun. It's not completely shade. And if it rains, it rains. It doesn't rain as hard as it does outside. It is on some level a refuge and a covert from downpour and from rain, but only partially. And inevitably, we can't help but ask ourselves, what's the point of the sukkah? And in particular, getting back to what we read in Leviticus chapter 23, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in Sukkot. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. On the one hand, we can understand this, and this is indeed one of the traditional understandings of this verse, that the children of Israel, in their 
40 years sojourning in the wilderness, dwelled in Sukkot. They needed something to give them refuge. After all, they were in the wilderness. But of course, since they were moving, they couldn't exactly go and build houses. So it was something collapsible. It was a sukkah. And when they would encamp in a given location, every family would set up its sukkah. And when it would be fine to move, they take down the sukkah and move it. That's one way of understanding this verse. And yet, you know, the sense you get from I made the children of Israel to dwell in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God, may imply more than that. Because after all, those Sukkot structures in which every family dwelt, they built themselves. I mean, you could say that God indirectly made the children of Israel to dwell in Sukkot, but it's, it's really indirect. I mean, after all, they were doing it themselves. And then there's the alternative view. And here, of course, I get to the verses I already intimated when we considered that portrayal in Isaiah chapter 4 of a cloud and smoke by day and the brightness of flaming fire by night, what we read, after all, at the end of Exodus chapter 13, when we read, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might go by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night departed not from before the people. And our tradition it didn't depart from the people at all for 40 years. And then on some level, it wasn't just a pillar in front of the encampment, but that the encampment was surrounded by clouds of glory that God made. So it's in that vein that God made the children of Israel to dwell in Sukkot. In Sukkot in the sense of this booth that was granted by God of these clouds of glory to protect Israel from the elements. And inevitably, coming to this understanding of the sukkah, that is either one, but the idea that the sukkah is intended to provide some tangible sense of being in a kind of quasi-refuge is in particular intended to drive home to us that as was the case with the children of Israel during the 40 years of sojourning in the wilderness, we too are under God's protection. God is the one watching over us and ultimately everything that informs our ongoing destiny is our con constant dependence upon God's providence. That's true whether we're speaking of the flimsy physical dwellings in which we lived or these clouds of glory, because ultimately, after all, it's all about God's providence. And, and obviously, it's self-evident. That's the message that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That connectedness to God. And inevitably, too, we'll note that obviously informs the time of year that we are bidden by God to leave our homes and go and dwell in the sukkah. What's so significant about this time of year? Well, we kind of already discussed this two weeks ago when we spoke about Rosh Hashanah. And in particular, of course, 
the holiday of ingathering. The holiday of ingathering is none other than the holiday of Sukkot, of Tabernacles, at the same time. And what in particular is so germane here in considering that holiday? Recall the way we saw it described in Exodus chapter 23. We noted this in our discussion of Rosh Hashanah and why the holiday that comes at the beginning of the seventh month is called the new year, that in Exodus chapter 23, in verse 16, it's the cycle of the pilgrimage festivals, we read it in the previous verse of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and then there's the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you sow in the field, and the Feast of Ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your labors out of the field. And of course, as we noted, this is what intimates to us that it's a new year, because it's the end of the year. Oh, end of the year, we realize we don't fall off the end if one year is ending, another year is beginning. But focusing in particular on the significance of the Feast of Ingathering, and again, we noted this, when we consider what the agricultural year looks like here, that is, in the Mediterranean climate, when there is no rain for the entire length of the summer, the rains abate and completely stop in late spring before the feast of the harvest. We stop praying for rain on Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, because the growing season for the crops is essentially up until then. So you have the feast of the harvest. And after the harvest, what do you do with all the produce that was harvested? You leave it sitting there in the fields in order to desiccate under the hot summer sun. And you bring it inside, in the granaries, the silos, whatever means of storage you have, before the rains begin, as I already shared with you, the rains have just begun. That is, the rains begin this time of year. And why is this so significant with respect to dwelling in Sukkot? Because there is no time of year when we might think of ourselves as more invulnerable than at the time of the ingathering. I'm loaded. I have all this grain. I have all this produce. I have everything. It's the time when we are least vulnerable materially and, of course, correspondingly, in greatest danger spiritually. Because it is precisely at that moment when you could think, I got it made. I rule over my destiny. Hold your horses. No. You are in God's hands. So at that moment, when you think you've got it made, get up, out of your house, go dwell in this temporary dwelling, this booth. It provides you with a measure of refuge, a measure of refuge from the heat. But you know, if there's a hot wave during Sukkot here, boy, you really feel it. And conversely, if there's a rainstorm, we pray it doesn't rain during Sukkot because then we can't fulfill the commandment of dwelling in the Sukkah. But if it rains, it rains in the Sukkah too. Not as hard as outside. Again, it's a refuge and a covert from the downpour and the rain, but only partially. So you get out of your home, you get out of this um, delusional sense that I'm in control of everything and I've got it made. And you bask in this realization that we're all in God's hands. And that really, most essentially, is the critical message of the Sukkah. It's, of course, again, the message that we read in both Exodus 
chapter 23, and again in Exodus chapter 34, where again, this holiday is described as the feast of ingathering. In Exodus chapter 34, it's described as the turning point of the year as opposed to the end of the year, but the, the message is essentially the same. In both instances, it is to protect us from the dangers of hubris, pride, that can come with this high point of the year, the Feast of Ingathering, when I finally think I've got it made. Because all the produce is coming into my home now. You don't. You don't have it made. You're not in charge. And you know, inevitably, what we hear perhaps most resoundingly is the warning in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And, and inevitably, we, we sense the resonance between Deuteronomy chapter 8 and the description of God causing us to dwell in these temporary dwellings during the 40 years in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, from verse 2, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might afflict you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. And he afflicted you, and suffered you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you knew not, neither did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread only, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. So, that's food. He fed you manna to teach you this message. You're not in charge. You depend upon everything that comes forth, as it were, from the mouth of God. And it's not just food, it's also clothing. Next verse, your clothing did not grow old upon you, neither did your foot swell, that is, your shoes didn't wear out, these 40 years, and uh, so you have food, clothing, food, clothing, where's shelter? Oh, of course, shelter, that's Leviticus chapter 23, that's precisely the message, in Leviticus chapter 23, that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths, in Sukkot, when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, to have that sense, food, clothing, shelter, everything that you need, God provides. But know that indeed, it's God who's providing. You're not in business for yourself. And there is, in this vein in particular, the warning first enunciated in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5, and you shall consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. And more sternly, verse 11, beware, lest you forget the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and dwell therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, who led you through the great and dreadful wilderness wherein were serpent, serpents, fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water who brought you forth water out of the rock of flint. Drink. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers knew, knew not, that he might afflict you, and that he might prove you to do you good at your latter end. Food. And just in general. If you forget all that, in verse 17, and you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand, have gotten me this wealth. 
remember the Lord your God, for it was he who gave you the power to get the wealth. Of course your power was involved in your getting the wealth. Okay, but God gave you the power that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto your fathers as it is this day. So, when we consider then what's the message of the sukkah? To be dwelling in that temporary dwelling that symbolizes God's providence. God watched over you in the wilderness and he's watching over you right now. And lest you be distracted by all the material wealth because it's the feast of ingathering and you're getting in all this produce, stop. Remember, it's all about your relationship with God. So at that moment that might delude you into thinking that you are invulnerable, that moment at which you are spiritually most vulnerable to pride, to hubris, to thinking that you're in control, get out of your house. Live in a sukkah for seven days. That'll give you your bearings again. You'll appreciate that it's all part of an ongoing dialogue between you, between each of us and God. The message of the sukkah. And inevitably, having come to this realization, remember our opening question. So, is Sukkot a parochial commemoration? Or is it universal? Is it for Israel? Or is it for all the world? And of course, inevitably the answer is yes. It is in the rawest sense, of course, a reflection of the history of Israel that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. No doubt about it. But um, is Israel the only one who needs to remember that? Doesn't the whole world need to remember that? And maybe we'll also add, remember context, Zechariah chapter 14. It's after all the nations that came to do battle against God in Jerusalem after they are destroyed, that those who are left come to celebrate Sukkot. As if to say, we're not going to make that mistake over again. That is, those nations, they thought they were in business for themselves. They thought they were in control. They thought they could do whatever they pleased. Uh -uh, No more deadly mistake than that. And so those who remain come to celebrate Sukkot together with all Israel and all of the world. Israel and all the nations are celebrating Sukkot because that statement of dwelling in the Sukkah, in that bastion of God's providence, is such a critical message for each and every one of us. And that's a universal message. And that's a message that applies to all the nations. And that's, well, that's answer number one for why there is this universal dimension of Sukkot. But um, I'm not finished yet. (laughs) Because on answer number one, we'll build answer number two. And on answer number two, we build answer number three. Well, I don't want to scare you off. Let's just move forward into the realm of answer number two. So answer number two inevitably brings us to another completely different elaboration on this festival, the elaboration that we read in Numbers chapter 29. Now we're talking about the self-same festival, there's no doubt about it because the date is the same. The date as expressed in Numbers chapter 29 verse 12 is the 15th day of the seventh month and what ensues is that's the first day and then there's the second day and the third day and the fourth day and the fifth day and the sixth day and the seventh day. Yes, this is the seven days of 
the holiday of Sukkot, the holiday of tabernacles. But the particular point of emphasis in Numbers chapter 29 is the special offerings that were brought upon the altar in the Holy Temple. Now, you might rightly note that we don't have a Holy Temple today. And we can't bring these offerings. So this might just seem like a completely airy abstraction. Well, first of all, let, lest there be any mistake about this, we continue to pray every single day for the restoration of the Holy Temple. No doubt about it. But more importantly, right now, we don't have the Holy Temple, but we have the message. And, you know, as we read in Hosea, in chapter 14, we will supplement for the bulls with our lips. So, you know, when we study God's word, we, we actualize on a symbolic level what God's word is telling us as a prescription. And what I'd like to focus upon in particular with respect to Numbers chapter 29 is, I'm not going to read all of the verses that describe the offerings brought on the festival of Sukkot for those seven days, because that goes clear through verse 34. And I'm afraid I'll, where am I? Welcome by then. So I'm just going to note very briefly that we read in chapter 29 of Numbers, verse 13, that on the first day of Sukkot, 13 bulls were brought upon the altar. On the second day, we read in verse 17, 12 bulls. On the third day, we read in verse 20, 11 bulls. On the fourth day, we read in verse 23, 10 bulls. On the fifth day, we read in verse 26, 9 bulls. On the sixth day, in verse 29, we read 8 bulls. And finally, on the seventh day, verse 32, 7 bulls. And of what significance are these offerings? Well, we add 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 13 equals 70. And of what significance is the number 70? Well, we know if you tally up all the descendants of Noah listed by name in Genesis chapter 10, you get 70. These are the 70 archetypal nations of the world. Now, you might rightly argue that there are an awful lot more than 70 nations in the UN today, and our response will simply be that just as on your computer screen or your television set, you have three different colored pixels, you know, the red, yellowish green, and bluish purple. And from these three primary colors, you can make every hue in the rainbow. So in the same vein, there are 70 primaries when it comes to the nations of the world. We have an ancient tradition that the number 70 signifies every possible way of looking at something. That's why in the court that Moses is enjoined by God to establish in Numbers chapter 11, there are 70 elders. Because in order to be able to have a great court, you need to be able to see something from every possible perspective. So hence the significance of the number 70. And in the same vein, in the grand cosmic symphony of singing the praises of God, you need every perspective. Each and every nation 
signifies a unique dimension, if you will, in this grand cosmic symphony orchestra, a unique instrument. And you produce the symphony precisely by every nation making its contribution. So there are these 70 nations. And the offerings brought on Sukkot are intended as offerings on behalf of the nations of the world so that the world should not be desolate of them, meaning that they should prosper. And in particular, and as much as it's the beginning of the year, that this is the offering on behalf of the nations of the world. All the archetypal nations are represented. Well, you know, that's of course pretty explicit as a universalistic dimension with respect to the observance of Sukkot. And I'll add here an additional dimension. We have this tradition that pertains to Psalm 109, that when we read on some level the complaint of the psalmist for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the seat have they opened against me they have spoken unto me with a lying tongue they compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause in return for my love they are my adversaries but i am all prayer in return for my love they are my adversaries but i am all prayer is the declaration of Israel in bringing these 70 offerings in the holy temple, on the holy altar, on behalf of the nations, and in return for the, my love, they are my adversaries. And they have laid upon me evil for good and hatred for my love. Now, of course, I'm going to stress, we know very well that's not all the nations. But, you know, simultaneously, boy, we sure get an object lesson in what hatred looks like by reading the news, seeing what's going on in the world today. I'm not talking about the axis of evil. I'm talking about, you know, I don't even want to mention them by name, but the supposed leaders of the West that call for an arms embargo against Israel and who are constantly self-righteously wringing their hands in a moral equivalence between the terrorists and their victims. So it's still very much, very much a presence, without any question. I, I just feel compelled to share with you, precisely in emphasizing that it's not everyone. You know it's not everyone. I know it's not everyone, because I'm experiencing all of you. And... I feel compelled to share with you a tradition that we have with respect to the second verse of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter one, verse two. Now, you can look up this verse in your translations. The only thing is that the translation is not literal. I know it's not literal because there's no way of translating it literally into English or any other language because the construction in this verse is a peculiar verb form. It's called the doubling of the verb, which is a unique construction in biblical Hebrew that doesn't even exist in post-biblical Hebrew. The opening words are bacho tifke balayla. If I wanted to try to translate that literally, it would have to be something like um, she, Zion, weeps, weeping or something along those lines, something that doesn't really work, of course, in English or in any other language. But the doubling of the verb prompts the question, so if there's this doubled verb, does that imply that someone else is weeping besides Zion? And our tradition proposes a number of answers to this question. The one that is germane from my perspective is, she is weeping, and the nations of the world are weeping with her. 
she's weeping because of the loss of the temple. The nations of the world are also weeping because of the loss of the temple, because they appreciate that when the temple was standing, it was providing atonement and protection for them. Now, of course, you always find the cynics who will say, what? They weren't weeping, they were destroying. To which, of course, inevitably, we respond, and I know each and every one of you resonates with this response, never paint everyone with one brush. There were those who were destroying, but there were, there were those also who were weeping over the destruction. At the time of the destruction, the voices of those who were weeping were inaudible. Only the author of Lamentations, who by our tradition is the prophet Jeremiah, was able to sense them. But we can sense them today. So there is unequivocally that dimension, and that dimension is crucial. That is the realization that what the temple signifies within the broader scheme of things, in particular on the Feast of Tabernacles, is a universalist message. It's Israel, but it's also the nations of the world, and it's specifically tabernacles. And it's precisely in that light, then, that we appreciate the nations of the world coming to celebrate Sukkot. And if you ask me, is there a connection between the first answer and the second answer? Because this is the second answer, of course. Inevitably, my answer is going to be, of course. That is precisely because there is this universal dimension that pertains to our consciousness that we are indeed all basking in God's providence. We're not in business for ourselves. That's what informs this atonement on behalf of the nations of the world. And uh, if I can further amplify this theme, maybe we'll call this answer 2B. It also pertains to the temple. It pertains to the temple, but it also pertains in particular to remember the four species that we take and wave on the festival of Sukkot. The palm branch, the citron, the myrtle branches, the willow branches. And you know, the formulation that we read to be very precise, in Leviticus chapter 23 was that you take them and you rejoice before the Lord seven days. Before the Lord means in the precincts of the Holy Temple. So again, there's that dimension that pertains to the Temple. But what I want to stress in, in particular with respect to this is, you know, in commemoration of Israel at the time that the temple was standing, when everyone would be circling the holy altar with the four species on each of the days of the festival, with the exception of the Sabbath. So um, we have that today. We take a Torah scroll and everyone circles the Torah scroll with the four species, except on the Sabbath. And we read various passages, including passages from the Bible, when we do this ceremony on each of the days of the holiday. And I feel compelled to share with you, you know what the last two lines are of this daily ceremony? The last two lines are from the prayer of dedication of King Solomon that we read in the first book of Kings, chapter 8, verses 59 and 60. But before I read those words, I want to keep this as a, a short cliffhanger. Before I read those words, verses 59 and 60, I need to stress something about King Solomon's prayer of dedication of the Holy Temple, which again is what we read in the first book of Kings chapter eight. You'd think that in his prayer of dedication of the Holy Temple, he'd be focusing upon the temple service, maybe at least 
mention the temple service? Something about the temple service? Not a word. The prayer of dedication is all about prayer. About praying to God via the Holy Temple. And before I get to verses 59 and 60, again, I'm leaving them dangling for the moment. You know, inevitably, most of the prayer is about the prayers of Israel. But I need to share with you what King Solomon says in verses 41, 42, and 43. Moreover, concerning the stranger that is not of your people Israel, when he shall come out of a far land for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and of your strong hand and of your outstretched arm, when he shall come and pray toward this house. I have to stick in parenthetically that I always read these verses whenever I take a group of Christian pilgrims to the Western Wall, the remnant of the Holy Temple. Because, you know, you can call out to God anywhere in the world, but there are places where it's a long-distance call. Whereas, come to Jerusalem, it is closer than local. You're right there. Verse 43 Hear you in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calls to you for, that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you as does your people Israel and that they may know that your name is called upon this house which I have built. Did you hear that? Do according to all that the stranger calls to you for. Give him whatever he asks for. Now, this contrasts in the previous verses where King Solomon is talking about the prayers of Israel, he doesn't say anything like that. On the contrary. In verses 38 and 39, any prayer and supplication so ever be made by any man or by all your people Israel who shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands towards this house, then hear you in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and do and... Render unto every man according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you, even you only know the hearts of all the children of men. In other words, render unto every man according to his ways. Give him what he deserves. That's with respect to the prayers of Israel. But with respect to the prayers of the stranger, give him everything he asks for. Why the difference? So in short, with respect to Israel, it's what we call tough love. Give him what he deserves. Prod him to do better. With respect to the stranger who's coming from a far land, you have to give him first and foremost a chance to get to know God. So give him everything he asks for. Everything he asks for, that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you as does your people Israel. And now I get to verses 59 and 60, with which we conclude, again, the daily prayers on the festival of Sukkot, when we're holding these four species in our hands. And let these my words, wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord, be near unto the Lord our God day and night, that he execute justice for his servant and justice for his people Israel, each day's need on its day that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else. And that's the final line, that all the peoples of the earth may know. So that message. You can't really get much more universal than that, can you? So again, I'm calling this 2B because it also has to do with the temple. That is, this is the message that all the peoples of the earth may know the, that the Lord, he is God, there is none else. So, of course, ultimately, all the world is going to be keeping Sukkot because that's the message. It's all there. And inevitably, the culmination of that is all the nations come to celebrate Sukkot in Jerusalem. So that's my second answer. First answer, that universal message of divine providence, connecting with God. It has to do with the history of Israel, but ultimately it's a message that pertains to every human being. Second message, 
Second message, the offerings brought in the Holy Temple, the 70 bulls, and this message, the culmination of King Solomon's prayer, that all peoples of the earth may know that the Lord, He is God, there is none else. That's also a universal message that ultimately pertains to the entire world. So all the nations will come to Jerusalem to the temple and celebrate Sukkot. And then there's an additional dimension. The additional dimension pertains to another sukkah. Yes, indeed, we read about another sukkah in the Bible. I mean, of course, we read about a number of other sukkot, but this one is on very significant real estate in the Bible. We read about the sukkah that the prophet Jonah builds in Jonah chapter 4. So I know everyone is familiar with the story of the book of Jonah. I'll just recap very briefly that prophet Jonah comes into the city of Nineveh, announces another 40 days and the city will be overturned and the city is roused to repentance and God saw their deeds that they had returned from their evil ways and he relented of the evil that he was going to bring upon the city and didn't do it. And of course, on some level, I'm going to say, parenthetically, that, um, well, you know, the city of Nineveh was overturned. You had a depraved city that was doing that which was evil in God's eyes and in 40 days, they all returned to God. Wow, if that's not overturned, I don't know what it is. But the truth of the matter is, while we can understand that in retrospect, even Jonah didn't understand that. And so at the beginning of chapter 4, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, I, I need to stress this point as, as we soak up the message of Jonah chapter 4. Because, you know, if you ask your average man on the street, what's the message of the book of Jonah? I suspect the answer will probably be the message of the book of Jonah is about repentance, that is, that repentance works, and it averted the evil decree that God had decreed against the Inveh, which is okay, but the book of Jonah is four chapters long, and that only works for the first three. The fourth is after they already repented, so who needs chapter four? So what happens in chapter four? Jonah is angry. He is displeased. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray you, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my own country? Therefore I fled beforehand unto Tarshish. I tried to flee from doing your bidding and conveying your prophecy. For I knew that you are a gracious God and compassionate, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and repents of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech you, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. I can't take this forgiveness by you. I want to die. And the Lord said, are you rightly angry? No answer. Then Jonah went out the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there he made him a sukkah. That's what it says here. Same word. He made a sukkah and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Of course, in the shadow, because that's what a sukkah does. It provides shadow, remember? And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his evil. So Jonah was exceeding glad because of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd and withered. And it came to pass when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah and he fainted and requested for himself that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Parenthetically, this is a prophet here, but you know, you see the exact same expression he uses when he's overwrought of God being so forgiving, and now he's overwrought over a 
gourd. I guess that tells you something about the human condition, doesn't it? And God said to Jonah, are you rightly angry for the gourd? And this time Jonah gives an answer. I am rightly angry even unto death. I can't take it. And here's where we get to the final ultimate message of the book of Jonah. Really, really soak in this message. Of course, it's just so critical. And the Lord said, you had pity on the gourd for which you didn't labor, neither did you make it grow, which came up in one night and perished in one night. And I shouldn't have pity on Nineveh, that great city, wherein there are more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left hand, and much cattle? Question mark, the end. That's the last word of the book of Jonah. The last two words of the book of Jonah are much cattle. That's the message of the book of Jonah. So what is this message of the book of Jonah? And of course, the message. The profound final word of the book of Jonah. They are all my children. You are overwrought that I'm a forgiving God. They're all my children. The people who don't know their right hand from their left hand, they're my children. The cattle, the cattle are also my children. They are all in the most basic and literal sense of the word, my creatures. Which means that even if they have nothing else going for them other than the fact that I created them, that's what makes them creatures. I still have pity over them. I have paternal love for them. I'm their father. This is the final resounding message that the prophet Jonah hears in the sukkah, the sukkah outside of Nineveh. Now, you could say this is a, um, a rather uh, tenuous bridge between the fourth chapter of the book of Jonah and the holiday of Sukkot. And I have to admit that um, I have a bias here. The bias is, you folks will know when in our cycle of the readings of the Bible, we read the book of Jonah. We read the book of Jonah on the afternoon of Yom Kippur. That's just five days before Sukkot. And so essentially right before, just after Yom Kippur ends, we go out and build the sukkah. So right before we go out and build the sukkah, what sukkah are we talking about? We're talking about the sukkah in which God reveals this crucial message to Jonah. They are all my children. I am the father of them all. If that's not a universal message that comes from the sukkah, I don't know what it is. Now, I do feel compelled to preempt what might be a rebuttal here. What might be a rebuttal is, you know, someone might say, wait, but we read in Exodus chapter 4 that God says to Moses, this is in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, you shall say unto Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So... Is the rest of the world God's children? And of course, inevitably, my answer. And I must admit that my answer I'm borrowing from one of the great Bible scholars of the late 19th century, whom we have mentioned before. We mentioned him last week as well. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, Rabbi of Frankfurt, who in his commentary notes the obvious. You never refer to an only child as firstborn. He's not a firstborn. He's an only child. When you say firstborn, that means there are others. The role of the firstborn is to open up the womb for all who will follow. Israel's role is simply that, 
to open up the womb for all of humanity. But they're all God's children. Everyone is God's children. And that's the message that comes from the sukkah. And that's the message that comes from the sukkah. Inevitably, crucially, that is the message that must find its expression in this universalist dimension of Sukkot. Now, inevitably, I just need to supplement this with the obvious realization. Remember what we said, in particular, two weeks ago in discussing Rosh Hashanah, vis-a-vis the holiday of ingathering that's at the end of the year. That you have the new year that is specifically described in terms of the new year. New, that's the month of the Exodus, which is the head of the months of the year. And then you have the new year that's described in terms of the end of the year. That's precisely this time of year. And again, it's in our inevitable understanding that we don't fall off the end when we get to the end of the year, that we appreciate that there must be the beginning of a year this time of year also, but it's specifically expressed in terms of the end because the new year in spring directs our gaze forward. This new year directs our gaze backward, retrospective, getting a sense of the whole picture and that's also part of the universalist message of Sukkot, which is, of course, the holiday that's specifically described as taking place at the end of the year. Th- that universalist message that ultimately informs what the relationship needs to be of Israel and the nations of the world coming together. You know, I have this obsession in quoting Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. Then I will turn to the peoples a pure language that they may all call in the name of the Lord to serve him. As Pastor Mark likes to point out, doesn't say shoulder to shoulder, it says with one shoulder. We become conjoined twins. And that coming together is precisely this message that it's coming together in the word of God. To my mind, it just, it boggles my mind to see all of you and we're here together. Well, okay, we're not physically healed together in one room. We will, God willing, be all together. Pastor Mark, we pray together. We will be all together in December here in the land of Israel. So right now we are virtually together on Zoom. It may not be exactly the same as being actually together in the land of Israel. Well, not even close, but still. But still, I submit that this is an initial fulfillment of these words of Zephaniah. That everyone coming together, they may all call in the name of the Lord to serve him one shoulder all together. And of course, inevitably, it's in that vein that we appreciate the message, the message enunciated in Isaiah chapter 42 and in Isaiah chapter 49, the the mission that starts, after all, with Israel, but cannot end there. That in chapter 42, verse 6, I have set you as a covenant of the people, a light of the nations, to establish all nations. That's what the covenant of the people means. To communicate this message in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, which of course is, is explicitly addressed to you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. I will also give you for a night light of the nations that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth. Because it doesn't suit God for the salvation to just be for one people or one bunch of people, it's that my salvation will be unto the end of the earth. So that by that light, 
as we read in Isaiah chapter 40. Arise, shine, for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is shown upon you. And nations shall walk at your light and kings at the brightness of your shining. So inevitably, this is also part of the message of the sukkah. If I can um, just maybe briefly supplement this, if I'm not going, going overboard. Well, there's just a couple of other sukkot that I think help to drive this point even for, more forcefully home. So, you know, just doing a, a brief overview of some other scriptural passages that pertain to the sukkah. Um, Psalm 76. I know in other contexts we've mentioned Psalm 76. Well, it's about a sukkah. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is set his sukkah, his tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion. So, of course, you know, we, we appreciate from this verse that Salem is Jerusalem because Zion and Salem are the corresponding numbers in the form of the biblical couplet. There he broke the fiery shafts of the bow, the shield, and the sword, and the battle, Selah. Glorious are you and excellent, coming down from the mountains of prey. God destroys the forces of evil. And what's the consequence of that? That after the forces of evil are destroyed, in Judah God is known. His name is great in Israel. And how was that expressed? The sukkah. The tabernacle. And you're able to sense, sense so intimately God's providence. And another sukkah. The sukkah about which we read in Amos chapter 9, verse yes. 11. In that day will I raise up the sukkah, the tabernacle of David that is fallen. And close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. And again, what is that message? That message is precisely that message of the restoration, that message of ultimately the redemption of the world, that they may possess the remnant of Adam and all the nations upon whom my name is called, says the Lord that does this. And what follows from this precisely is the words of consolation. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that sows seed and the mountains shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt the restoration of the Holy Land. And I will return the captivity of my people Israel and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them and I will plant them upon their land and they shall no more be plucked up out of their land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. What a sukkah-esque message. And how do I know it's so dramatically a sukkah-esque message? Well, very simply, because in verse 1, I read that, um, that, that um, this is the message, ultimately, that is being conveyed by God as the consequence of the retribution, the punishment, as the basis, ultimately, of the promised restoration. And again, it's going to be described precisely in terms of a sukkah. And uh, one, one more passage, if I may, another clearly sukkah-esque message. This is in the Second Temple period. Haggai, Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once 
it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all the nations and the choicest things of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Mine is the silver and mine is the gold, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Now, this is cosmic end gathering, isn't it? I will shake all the nations. I don't know, maybe that's the earthquake that we read in Ezekiel chapter 38 and then Zechariah chapter 14. And the choicest things of all the nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And how do I know that, that this prophecy has something to do with Sukkot? Well, here verse 1 reads, And in the seventh month, in the 21st day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, the 21st day of the seventh month. That's the seventh day of Sukkot. What an obvious connection. And, um, and ultimately, of course, I, I can't talk about in-gathering without concluding with the words of Isaiah chapter 2. And with this, I'll, this I'll, I'll finally conclude. It will come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall stream unto it. Ultimately, it's not just about Sukkot. They all stream unto it. And many peoples shall go and say, go you and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, unto the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will go in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth Torah, teaching, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and reprove many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and the spirit into the burning oaks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The cosmic Sukkot, the ingathering, everything gets ingathered to God. And it's all of us together, which is the greatest blessing of all. So um, on that note, again, I'm, I'm going to express my thanks first and foremost to Pastor Mark and also to each and every one of you, because I, I think... We're doing in gathering right now, also. God bless you. Well, thank you, Chaim. Uh, I have uh, two questions, comments. One of them is Isn't it understood in Judaism in light of Zechariah 14 and in Ezekiel 38 that the Gog Magog war literally happens during Sukkot? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think that is a, a possible interpretation of the fact that that's what we read on Sukkot as the reading from the prophets. That is, we read the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38 and the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 14. But of course, it's not explicit that it takes place during Sukkot. And they all, I guess I'll take it whenever it happens. But uh, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I just thought it was interesting how it tied on Sukkot. Everyone has but to certainly, come but certainly, it's certainly like the, the anniversary. The idea unequivocally, the idea is a Sukkot idea, unequivocally. Now, the next thing is this. Jonah was the son of Emmet, truth, I, my truth. I think it's fascinating that uh, the difference is Jonah was looking at my truth versus God's truth. <laughs> That's an interesting... Look, ultimately, our truth needs to get aligned with God's truth. I, I, I definitely accept the point. And um, I just and thought that was fascinating. He's yeah. the son of, I look at today. Everyone has their own truth about what's going on from October 7th, from everything that happens. Yeah, and people don't really care much about God's truth, do they? Nope. Yeah. But well I said. sure thank you so much. I well have an said. appointment, so I've got to run. You can continue to answer questions as long as you want. But again, yeah. I just want to thank you so much. I want to thank I thank you, Pastor Mark, for having this opportunity. I, I certainly hope we won't have to wait until next Sukkot to do it again. I'm ready to do it next week if we can. Well, I plan to see you in a couple months. God willing. But we can still have another online session before then, right? Oh, yeah. Take care. Okay. God bless you. Take care. Bless you. Thanks, if anyone would like to have any further Shalom. questions, I'm, I'm happy to Shalom, Rabbi. Shalom, Gerald. Hey, yes. Hey. Yeah, Hak Hey, I have a quick Hak question. 
I have a quick question regarding the temple. And um, and Ezekiel 38, uh, 20 specifically says that um, every wall will crumble and uh, to the ground. And then in Zechariah, we talked earlier that the Mount of Olives is going to split. And, um, you know, during the, the Gog and Magog war, that everybody's going to going to know God. And so the question is, is that do we deserve consensus among uh, rabbis that that's the time when the, the the temple will be built after the great earthquake and after the war and um, and that everybody will want to build the temple after they mm. see after they see you know the the God doing all His work with the earthquakes and 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 all these things. Mm. What do you think about that? So I, I'm going to say um, from our perspective, the commandment to build the holy temple which we read, of course, in Exodus chapter 25, they shall make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell in their midst, is not a temporary or one-time business. It is an eternal commandment. So we're ready to build the, the, the temple today, let alone tomorrow. We're always ready to build the, build the temple. Um, and and um, I'll amplify that even further. Uh, besides the commandment in Exodus chapter 25, which, of course, in inevitably is a commandment that is first fulfilled by the nation of Israel in the wilderness, when we read in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5, pertaining to the temple, they shall seek out the place of God's indwelling and come there. That is a perpetual commandment to seek out the place of God's indwelling, to seek the place of the temple. So, um, so absolutely, that never stops. That's the constant focus of our attention. But I certainly agree with you. You know, the uh, the reality is that, of course, we aren't able to go ahead and build it right now. Once the nations of the world come to this realization, then of course it will be a, a piece of cake. That right. is, um, it, to share with you, um, in 1929, as many of you are undoubtedly aware, the land of Israel was shook by a, a, a horrific wave of pogroms that were perpetrated by the Arab inhabitants against the Jews. There were almost 60 people who were hacked to death in the most grisly manner imaginable in the city of Hebron, the Jewish community, the ancient Jewish community in the city of Gaza was destroyed. And, um, and after the devastation, the British, who of course had the mandate of the League of Nations over the land of Israel, convened a commission of inquiry to decide whether in light of this program, they should deny Jewish access to the Western Wall for prayer. Um, if that doesn't make any sense to you, that's a good sign. It shouldn't make right. any sense. Right. But remember, of course, this was before appeasement got a bad name with uh, Neville Chamberlain. Um, in any case, uh, one of the people who was called to testify before this commission was the chief rabbi, Rabbi Cook. And reportedly, one of the commissioners said to him menacingly, isn't it true that you Jews want to build your temple where the Muslims have their mosques? And the rabbi, the rabbi calm, calmly responded, when it is time to restore God's house, the Muslims will be running ahead of us to take apart their mosques in order to make room for God's temple restored. Which wasn't just a brilliant comeback. It's true. That is, again, that's the message that... The nations of the world were weeping when the temple was destroyed. And we have a tradition. If, if they would have realized what the temple was for them, they would have surrounded it by legions to, to protect it. They didn't appreciate it. And unfortunately, there are a whole lot of folks out there, not you, there are a whole lot of folks out there who don't appreciate it today either. And uh, undoubtedly, on that blessed day, they will realize. They will appreciate it. So we're, uh, we're praying and striving and, and struggling to bring that day closer. Thank you. Do you think they would build it before the 
the earthquake if they knew an earthquake was coming they would still build we, it. we have we, we don't we don't we don't make calculations we obey god says build the temple we build the temple we build okay. we'll build we'll build it today if we can we so might that. try to make it earthquake resistant, but that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is, after all, God will make it earthquake resistant even if we don't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Anyone else? Um, this is Sue from Pennsylvania. Oh, sh yes. Shalom. I have one uh, comment that I had learned from my rabbi Imo Shalev on Aleph Beta and he made a comment on the four species the choice fruit the palm mm -hmm. fronds which are leaves the branches and then the willows which are trees and he's connecting that back to the Garden of Eden where we're working our way backwards now that we are allowed and actually commanded to take fruit instead of not being allowed to eat the fruit. And we work our back way back to the tree of life, which is the Torah. Okay, I, I, the, the, um, I, of course, it's, it's more for me to supplement that they, they were welcomed and enjoined to eat fruit, just not the, fr fr the fruit of the tree of knowing good and evil. Correct. Now, there is, there is um, a, a um, uh, opinion in the Midrash, that the tree of knowing good and evil was indeed the citron. So uh, I guess that okay. would be corresponding to that idea. And of course, the prohibition was to eat it. Not, 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 not there wasn't any prohibition to touch it, even though uh, Eve said there was or thought there was. But, um, but like, I, I don't know if I would express it in terms of going back to the Garden of Eden, because ultimately, I'm going to say. You know, I, I always feel compelled to stress this point that when we consider what takes place in the aftermath of the sin of Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, just, uh, let me just put the second... Um, Okay, so um, in the wake of having eaten of the tree of knowing good and evil, God, after dispensing the punishment, which really is, I wouldn't say so much punishment as the consequences. You've chosen to become creative beings, and you will inevitably need to bear the consequences of creativity. And creativity hurts, which is essentially the message that God conveys to Eve with respect to the most creative act in which any human being could possibly engage, childbirth. And for the other half that can't engage in the most creative act possible, then the most creative act is coaxing sustenance out of a recalcitrant earth to feed the, the babies whom um, the, the most Next creative generation. being is able to produce. Um, yeah. Okay, and then and then what happens after that? I, I'm reading from verse 22. And the Lord God said, "Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever." So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, the cherubim and the flaming sword or the blade of the revolving sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Right? This is what we read in Genesis chapter 3? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes? Yes. No. No? No. I tricked you and no one <laughs> even noticed. I just read... Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, followed by verse 24, and I skipped verse 23, and you didn't even notice. And I did it, I didn't do it to trick you. I did it to make a point. 
because conceptually verse 24 follows verse 22. That is in verse 22, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life. So he drove out the man out of the garden. Now, of course, I should note, even with respect to those two verses, that the message most critically in the preventing man from eating of the tree of life is because there wouldn't have been anything wrong with man eating of the tree of life if he hadn't eaten of the tree of knowing good and evil. But after having eaten of the tree of knowing good and evil, there is the dire possibility that men could eat of the tree of life and then live forever in an unredeemed state. That would be terrible. Yes. So don't eat of the tree of life because there has to be that, that, that purging that comes through death in order to be restored to a state of purity. But, um, but what about verse 23? So verse 23 is the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from whence he was taken. And this is so critical. Because if verse 22 would have been followed by verse 24, then you know what would come after verse 24? The end. Period. Because then God says, let's keep man from eating of the tree of life. And he drove out man, and that was it. Curtains. God forbid. That would be terrible. And that's precisely not the message of the Torah. Rather, there's verse 23 in the middle. The Hebrew reads, the, the opening word, which means God sent man on a mission. In, in essence, before it's described in terms of driving man out of the Garden of Eden because man can no longer live in a perceptive realm because he's become a creative being, which is a separate story. God, in essence, says to man, okay, now that you've eaten of the tree of knowing good and evil, you can't stay here. But don't think that means that the relationship between us is over. I am sending you now on a mission. It's going to be to work the ground from whence you were taken as the creative being that you have chosen to become. You're not going to be in the Garden of Eden anymore, but the relationship between us is not broken. You have a different mission than you would have had if you would be, have stayed in the Garden. But you still have a mission. So, you know, there is, of course, that dimension that we certainly won't deny, that there was a level of closeness in the Garden of Eden that we believe will only be fully restored in the Messianic era. But it's important also to stress that we have a job to do here and now, that it's not broken in that sense. There are things that are broken, right? We have to realize that we aren't in the same condition that we would have been had Adam and Eve not eaten of the tree of knowing good and evil. But there still is a relationship. And it's important to stress that because you know, we, we, we shouldn't think that everything is fine in this world, because it's certainly not. But we have to also avoid the opposite extreme of thinking that it's all about getting back to the Garden of Eden and that this world is inconsequential. We have a job to do in this world. God sent us on a mission to this world. And we, we are still summoned to fulfill that mission in everything that we do in this world. So, it's so we're still cultivating. We're still cultivating our ground. Right, right. Okay. And, and, that's, okay. and, that's, and that's a wonderful thing. Okay. That, is, that, that means we're not, we're not cultivating the ground from which we were taken because we decided that that's what we feel like doing. We're cultivating it because that's what God sent us to do. We're, we're fulfilling God's mission. Okay. To, to, to maybe put it in, in somewhat more um, highfalutin terms, that um, <laughs> now that we have become creative beings as a result of eating of the tree of knowing good and evil, God says, okay, go into the world of creativity, which is this world, not the Garden of Eden. Let's see what you're going to create here. Work the, work the ground. Produce the children. Try to create a better world. That's, okay. your, that's, your, that's your new mission. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that very much. God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else? Rosh Hashanah is not biblical at all.
uh, I think you need to listen to the session that we had two weeks ago. It was um, precisely addressing this question, and um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss it after, after you have a chance to listen to it. Okay, anyone else? Yes, I would like to uh, thank you again. I'm Iria uh, from Germany. Um, I thank you and your people that you have walked the land and you have cultivated the land and that you have shown it to us, to the nations. And being an example about that, what God uh, has told you to do and what is his will through your lives. And uh, we can benefit from that and follow you and and um, understand what uh, who God really is and what he wants from each one of us. And that is that is huge. That is really massive. And um, and I'm very grateful for that. And um, I would also like to add here a greeting from from the heaven. <laughs> um, on Rosh Hashanah, I was praying here at home, and after the prayer, I went outside, and over the hills, there was, there, it was cloudy day, but it had rained in the morning, and uh, the, the hill is to the east, um, and um, there was a cloud in the color of the rainbow. I've never seen, so I have never seen that before. Um, I've seen a rainbow, it's a bow, but this was a cloud and it was at the, to the east. And I thought, God is saying he's with you. And I want to pass that on as a hope on the, in this specifically difficult time um, to be hopeful and uh, to know that God is with you. Thank you for everything that you have done and given us. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you, and God bless you. And uh, yeah, I, I, I hope we can take that as a sign that even when it seems awfully cloudy and overcast, there could still be all the colors of the rainbow. And and the rainbow, of course, is the remembrance of God's everlasting exactly. covenant. Yes, yes, it was beautiful. It was like um, a very um, uh, soft. I don't know what that is in English. Uh, um, not strong colors, but very beautiful, yeah. beautiful colors, uh, but very distinctly the colors of the rainbow in the cloud to the east. And that's for you. God bless you. And thank, thank you for, so much for the words of encouragement that you've given me. You've really lifted me up. God bless you. Thank, thank you. God bless you too. Uh, I'm sorry, I see, I see MM has a hand raised, a, a virtual hand raised. Would, would, you, would you like to say something? Um, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, sure, um, please. I have a question. In, uh, is there, uh, according to uh, rabbinic tradition, or I, I'm interested in, in, in the biblical um, connection to the four species that you mentioned in Sukkot, if they have any connection to the four faces from Ezekiel in chapter 1, um, the, Ooh, the... um that's an interesting question i i'm i must admit i'm not aware of any connection expressed on that level um that's a it's a good one <laughs> the the um that, that is the, the four faces are ultimately intimations of um different modalities through which god's governance over the universe is manifest because that's after all the whole message of the so to speak the divine chariot that ezekiel beholds um i don't recall an interpretation of the four species in terms of um a, a, a symbol of god's governance of the world that is it's more a matter of our seeking different dimensions in the way that we come to God. But it's a, you're raising a fascinating question. And I have to admit, I haven't seen any, any interpretation on that plane, but I'll, I'll look into it. Um, thank you very much, because it's interesting. One uh, speaks yeah. of plants and the other speaks of uh, creatures. Right. 
Right. Thank you. Well, if you do, you, I'm interested in. Okay. Okay. That's a good challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. Thank you very much for your patience. I realize this is, this is a, has been quite a long session. So I'm very grateful for your putting up with me this long. And I hope we'll have additional uh, opportunities. And of course, I'm going to reiterate my gratitude to Pastor Mark for bringing us all together. And, uh, and I pray I'll be able to see as many of you as can come, God willing. We're talking about being able to get together here. We pray that God will give us a restoration of peace and security here in December. So I, uh, I pray we'll be able to knock heads together, not just virtually, but literally at that time. And, um, and I also hope, of course, uh, uh, I hope to be able to visit Sumner. For those of you who can come to the ministry in Sumner, I, I have I've discussed with Pastor Mark, God willing, in February, we hope to be back in Sumner also. So um, I hope one of those opportunities will enable us to get together. And God bless you all. And most of all, I wish you all a blessed new year, a, a blessed day of Yom Kippur coming up, and the blessed holiday, the, the Feast of Sukkot, God willing, in just another week and a half. God bless you all. Shalom. I am disabled. Sorry? I am disabled. Ah. Did, did you want to say something today? Do you, do you want to... I am disabled. May God bless you with every blessing. Let's see. Shalom. Uh...